Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Jonathan Judd, Mayor of Moorhead. Thank you all for coming this evening uh, to hear about the status of Moorhead's flood preparations. <clears throat> it has now approximately been 11 days uh, since uh, I declared an emer in emergency declaration and that the City Council ratified that dec declaration regarding our spring flood. <clears throat> During these past days, I anticipate in days to come, our community has sprung into action. Uh, we are extremely fortunate to live in a community where our residents and our neighbors come together in times of emergency. Uh, I had the uh, honor of doing some sandbagging this past Saturday, and I was talking with uh, Dr. Zimmerman and, and some others. When I was slinging those sandbags around, I felt like I was 20 years old again. Uh, however, on Sunday morning, I really felt like I was 50. Uh, and I'm close to that, but I'll tell you, it, it, it is a lot of hard work, but I will say uh, during that time that I was there, we had a lot of members uh, from the community pitching in to help out. I also met a uh, person from Fargo who, who came across the river to help out, 72 years old, throwing sandbags around. So it's great to even get people across the river to come over and support our uh, city. So that's a great job. I think it's important this evening also to reflect on the major investments that we've made in flood mitigation in, in the past 10 years, and they are actually paying us some pretty big dividends. Uh, you hear tonight how the flood fight from 2019 is much different than the flood fight of 2009. You hear from our flood command team on what the city is doing to prepare for the flood of 2019 to protect the infrastructure that serves our homes and our businesses. And if you live on the riverfront and you haven't already done so, you will have an opportunity tonight to visit with your zone leader. The zone leaders will be a resource to those of you on the riverfront. Before the presentation, I wanna give a special shout out to President Blackhurst of MSUM and also for staff for hosting and putting together this community event. But I also like to recognize the members of our city council who are here this evening. Uh, council members, do you mind standing, please? Thank you all for your support uh, throughout this process. I also like to <clears throat> recognize members of our city staff. If you may stand up, even those of you who are our IT department over there. So just, just so you are aware, our city staff has put in a long amount of hours, uh, dedication uh, to making sure that our city comes together and that we're all working as one team to efficiently get this job done to protect our city and our infrastructure. So thank you all for what you all have done for our community to get us to this point. I'll now turn the agenda over to Dr. Bob Zimmerman. And once again, on behalf for myself and our city council. Thank you all for coming this evening and a huge thank you to those who've already contributed to our flood preparation, primarily our volunteers. Thank you all again. Thank you, Mayor. Well, we have a brief presentation to uh, to begin the evening. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, the city's mission when it comes to preparation for flood events and how that relates to our pre-event planning for Thank you. Uh, how that relates to what we've uh, done this year, talk about implementation of our uh, flood plan, as well as some ongoing flood mitigation projects. And then at the conclusion of the presentation, we'll have an opportunity to break out and you can talk with zone leaders or look at some maps uh, related to uh, future flood mitigation projects. So really the, the city's flood mission boils down to three objectives. That's protecting the, the general health, safety, and welfare of the community as a whole, protecting uh, public infrastructure and services, and then utilizing the most efficient means and most reliable means to do that. And the tools, as we as city staff have available to us, first and foremost, the, the direction and the policy that's provided by, by our elected officials, the city council. This year, we have more flood mitigation infrastructure than we've ever had permanent flood mitigation infrastructure. We still do rely on temporary uh, protection measures to some degree, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, and there's also non-physical aspects, uh, how, we, 
how we implement different pieces of our plan, mapping activities, uh, as well as how uh, staff interacts across departments and across agencies. This is not strictly a city issue, but also brings in outside agencies, state agencies, and so on. So our pre-event planning really begins uh, early in the year. The National Weather Service starts to issue what they call probabilistic forecasts in January. And we keep close tabs on those uh, as they update those throughout the spring. These happen to be the numbers that were issued on March 15th of this year. They were significant in that they increased by about three feet for different probabilities. Uh, that's an attention getter uh, by, by any means, uh, by any imagination. So when we look at these numbers, what do they tell us? We gen generally focus on the 50% chance event, the 10% and the 5%. We look at the 10% and the 5% basically because history has shown in recent years that we can see those events, 2001, 2006, 2009. If you were to go back and look at probabilistically what were the chances of the events occurring that did occur, they would have fallen within that 5 to 10% range. We hope that we don't see that every time, but that's, that does happen, so we need to plan for those. If we don't pre-plan for those, we have no chance of executing a successful flood fight. On the other hand, we can have events like 2013 and hopefully 2019, where we do a lot of pre-planning that ultimately we may not need, but uh, we're flexible so that we can scale up or scale back. Some images uh, from 2009, not that anybody necessarily wants to recall uh, what 2009 was like for those of you that were here. And for anyone new to the area, we hope you don't ever experience what the community experienced in 2009. Uh, long lines of sandbag levees connected together throughout neighborhoods. Um, clay levees throughout town. 2009, we used uh, 2.5 million sandbags, all produced within about a week, uh, and uh, installed about nine miles of temporary clay levee. That was 2009. And the point of showing those pictures is to note that this, is diff this year is different for quite a few reasons, but primarily because the city has made a, a priority uh, of protecting itself better from floods. Flood mitigation projects uh, have been ongoing since uh, the 2009 flood, about $110 million invested to date. Huge support uh, from the state as a partner in this, as you'll see about $77 million of that came from the state of Minnesota. Uh, what benefits does that provide? About 260 uh, acquisitions of flood prone properties, about 12 miles of permanent levy. And for those of you were that were here in 2009, you may recall that uh, river water backing up through the storm sewer system was a significant concern. 78 gates installed on the storm sewer system to protect that uh, from future flood events, as well as 19 stormwater pump stations. Frequently get asked the question, to what level were these uh, levees and flood walls constructed? So all of our levees in town were constructed to a river stage of 44 feet. All of the flood walls were constructed to 45 feet. That's the top elevation of those improvements. So what does that mean in terms of what can we handle for a flood event? So ideally, you would like to have about three feet between the top of a levee and the highest water level. So very comfortably, 41 feet where these improvements are in place. Could you go a little, a little higher than that? Yes, you can, 42 probably, maybe even a little bit more, but the, the, less, uh, the less freeboard that we have, the less comfortable we're gonna be with those uh, improvements providing the intended protection. What is also different uh, between the last flood event and now is an annexation uh, that occurred. The Oakport neighborhood is now part of the city of Moorhead. We're extremely fortunate to have another partner agency in the uh, Buffalo Red River Watershed District who have been working on a permanent flood mitigation project in that area for a number of years. That actually began after the 1997 flood event. Again, very strongly supported by the state of Minnesota. That's a $36 million project 
with about $31 million of that coming from the state. Overall, that one involved about 60 home acquisitions resulting in about 6.1 miles of permanent levees as well as a number of stormwater improvements. However, there is an area uh, that was within that annexation that did not have a comprehensive flood mitigation project uh, in place. Uh, this is the generally the area of the McCann's addition, the Crystal Creek additions. Uh, we have been working uh, on a project for that area for a couple of years, uh, and we'll have that constructed in the near future pending funding. The point of raising this issue is not to go through the details of the project, just to note that this area uh, really was a driver in temporary measures for this upcoming flood event, planning for temporary measures for the upcoming flood event. How do we protect public infrastructure in this particular area when access to the riverfront is difficult? So a lot of what you'll see in terms of temporary measures was was driven by this particular portion of the city. And again, hopefully by the time we have another flood event, we'll have a permanent project in place. So we're still talking here about pre-event planning. Uh, this slide is a, a good summary of the uh, pre-event planning we did and comparing that to conditions uh, pre-2009 flood. So the two numbers, again, pre-event planning that we were looking at, the 50% chance number was about 38 feet. The 5 to 10% chance number was right around 41 feet. Those were our two planning targets. So for 38 feet, uh, pre-2009 flood conditions before all of the flood mitigation improvements, we would have needed 670,000 sandbags under current conditions less than 12,000. For a 41 foot crest pre-2009 conditions, 2.9 million sandbags. Uh, and our pre-event planning estimate was for current conditions was 143,000. Two points about that, the 143,000 on this slide was the number that drove the city's initial goal for sandbag production of 150,000. And the other point is you may have recalled that I just said we used 2.5 million sandbags in 2009, which was about 41 feet. We would have used 2.9 million sandbags had we had time. We didn't have proper freeboard on the sandbag levees that were built during that flood event, and we're quite frankly lucky that uh, the ones that survived did. Similarly, for temporary clay levees in terms of miles and cubic yards of clay material, you can see dramatic reductions. 38-foot uh, flood event, 3.6 miles, now down to a few hundred feet. And the 41-foot uh, flood, 10.5 and pre-2009 conditions down to about 1.6. So when we were looking at 38 and 41 feet, if you look at the historical records, either one of those would have placed us in the top 10. Of course, conditions are changing and we're hoping that we don't see either of those numbers. Um, but you'll note the top 10 numbers are, by today's standards, not all that impressive towards the lower end and getting to 35 feet is a very realistic uh, probability for, for this flood event. This is just a graphic representation of some of the numbers that you saw. So when you come in the previous slide, when you combine the, uh, the city uh, permanent improvements along with the uh, Buffalo Red improvements in the Oakport neighborhood, the yellow line here represents permanent levees that have been constructed. And I, I think it's just visually nice to see the extent uh, of those levees in terms of the area that they cover throughout the city. And then the other colors represent temporary clay levees that uh, would be implemented at different flood stages. Noting that we would no longer install any temporary clay levees below 38 feet river stage. So I mentioned it's not just physical infrastructure, it's how we organize ourselves and how we implement. So our flood plan, we have, again, many improvements made. Our flood plan is very robust. I want to recognize our assistant city engineer, Tom Trowbridge. This, he is the master of the flood plan. Uh, very detailed. A lot of information there. We have it in, in a tabular format that we use on a daily basis, but we also have it in a GIS or mapping format. Uh, and I want to recognize our GIS manager, Brad Anderson. These, these, are, these two tools are the heart 
of what we do. We've been implementing this flood plan now for about a week. It starts at River Stage 15. These plans make that effort very efficient. They're wonderful tools to have. The other thing that we've done for this flood event is, is taking a second look at how we organize ourselves uh, as city staff uh, and how we interact with other agencies. So this is really a cross-departmental effort. Uh, involves everywhere from public safety to public works to engineering. I've been here for a couple of flood events. Uh, I thought we did a pretty decent job organizationally in 2010 and 11 in preparation for 13. But what I can, what I can tell you honestly is that this organizational chart is orders of magnitude better than what we've uh, used in the past. We also have some, uh, some great tools. Uh, this property mapping tool is actually a tool that's available to you as citizens to look at your property. You can zoom into that property. You can click on it and this will tell you the critical river stage when water approaches a certain property and then also tell you the critical river stage for the structure. And you will have a chance to do that here tonight if you haven't already done so. So that was all about pre-event planning and you, now knowing what we know, 38, 41, it looks, it looks like we're not going to get to e either of those numbers, at least we hope we won't, barring any significant precipitation. Uh, this is what the deterministic forecast from the Weather Service uh, looks like. They have not yet, to my knowledge, as of late this afternoon, issued a crest forecast. Uh, but we expect that to be happening very soon. That's when we start to really zero in on how many of these temporary measures do we need to implement. Of course, all of that's weather dependent. What I can tell you is the wonderful efforts of volunteers. Uh, I want to point out Steve Moore, our public works director, Leanne Wallen, uh, with the volunteer effort for that. The preparation was excellent, and we're good right now with materials prepared for a 40 foot flood. So if we have an extreme event, we're there and we're ready. The good news is we can scale up or we can scale down from there. So if the unimaginable were to happen, we can still produce more sandbags and scale up. If the more likely at this point were to happen, we can scale back. So post pre-event planning, along with making sandbags, our uh, staff, our technical staff was taking a look closer at some of the uh, temporary measures that we were proposing to deploy and looking at alternative measures. And so by utilizing some alternative measures other than sandbags, so temporary clay levees or some more innovative type uh, measures, we were able to reduce the number of sandbags needed. So the columns under initial plan, those were the targets from the previous slide, the pre-event planning. Uh, and under the revised plan are the current numbers. So taking the 38 foot uh, river stage, our initial uh, plan would have required about 12,000. We didn't reduce that much. But for the 41 foot flood, you can see 143,000 down to 90. So these are the numbers that we are currently working with. You'll note, I said we were uh, prepared for a 40 foot flood, 45,000 sandbags, and the volunteer effort that went on last week generated about 55,000. And again, thanks to all of those that participated in that. We hope we never have to activate the, the, uh, the sock again, um, but it was a wonderful effort. Zone teams are something that we used in uh, 2010, 11, and 13. They proved to be uh, a very effective means of communication, so we're utilizing that again. Uh, anytime we have an emergency event, communication is always challenged. Communicating via phone and being via email is not effective. We learned that lesson in 2009. I think this, uh, this mode of operation has proved to be very effective. We did change the zones. So uh, you, you may note that you're in a different zone and these zones are not strictly intended for riverfront properties. They're intended for anyone near the river. Those teams uh, really serve as our technical resource in the field. They are the liaison to property owners, again, on or off of the riverfront. They are available to communicate what we're going on. So what we're doing that day, what's going on, we meet daily to talk through implementation of the steps in our flood plan that you saw previously. 
our zone leaders and our zone staff are involved in those meetings so they know everything that's going on. They are, they are the best resource for information. They also serve other purposes. They verify uh, flood plan implementation actions. So those various steps, they're a second check on that. Uh, they do some levy monitoring for us and they're supported by our engineering survey teams as well as by public safety teams. Couple words about utilities, uh, power, water, sanitary sewer. I see Bill Schwant from Public Services here. Travis Schmidt is here. Um, no service interruptions are expected, uh, but we do want to mention a couple things about storm drains. So earlier on, I had said we'd installed 78 storm water gates, right, to prevent river water from backing up into the storm sewer system. Well. When we close those gates, that means that snow melt and rain can't get to the river either. So we have to pump that. We installed about 19 pump stations to do that. And some of those locations at the lower river stages that have to, have to operate more frequently or, or more often, we have permanent pump installations. Some of those are, uh, are directly uh, driven with power. Others we use uh, what are called PTO pumps and they're driven by tractors. There are a few other locations on smaller drainage systems where we don't have permanent pump stations in, uh, installed. We use uh, portable pumps in those locations. Uh, the thing to note here is that all of our systems and all of the actions in our plan are generally sized for typical types of spring rain events. It is possible that you would see water backed up in a ditch or in a catch basin or maybe even a little bit of water in the street. That's perfectly acceptable. We, we uh, understand that that will happen. The only, we just want to make sure that we don't get water approaching somebody's property, somebody's structure. So just a heads up that if we do get a little bit of rain, you may see some water ponding. That's perfectly normal. The plan that we uh, are employing this year does include temporary clay levees in some locations. Again, as I mentioned, anything below 38 feet, we would not deploy uh, any any clay levies. So those functions uh, again are the, those functions to serve uh, to protect city infrastructure and then close gaps where we have them in the permanent levy system. So there are the they're all location specific. We would not build any of these until the forecast indicated that we needed to build those. In cases where we needed to, we would coordinate with any property owners that might be impacted. Again, the zone leaders are your point of contact if you happen to be an affected property owner. Where can we get information? i will point out Lisa Bodie, our public information officer, who is working hard to make sure that we share information. We have a, a call center uh, available if you want to make a phone call. A lot of information is being sent out via e-notifications, which you can sign up for if you haven't already. I cl you click the service alert portion, I believe, is if I got that right. That's, that is the, probably the best source of information and the quickest means to get information. City website is a good source of information as well as other social media. And certainly, if you haven't signed up for Code Red, that's, that is a, something that we strongly recommend. Just a couple of uh, comments here about ongoing flood mitigation projects. So as I mentioned, we've completed a, a large number of projects, but we're not done. Uh, in August of 2018, the City Council adopted a revised flood mitigation plan that includes a number of proposed property acquisitions and infrastructure projects. Uh, obviously, we need to fund that before we can build all of that, so it is dependent on funding and sources of funding. To date, we've received about $6 million in uh, state flood damage reduction grant assistance, and that all of that funding has been directed towards that North Moorhead flood mitigation project. We continue to seek state funding for that, um, and our local state legislators uh, inter introduced a bill uh, this year to, that would provide uh, 39 million in additional funding. Is 39 million in one shot likely to happen? Probably not, but it states the case for our needs. And if there is flood mitigation funding provided this year, I think we're a good candidate uh, for some of those funds to continue our work. 
So I mentioned proposed acquisitions. Uh, the proposed acquisitions in the revised plan are divided into three categories, A, B, and C. Those categories were established uh, based upon risk. First of all, the public infrastructure, and then risk to private property. Generally speaking, if we receive funding, our, our funding would be allocated based upon those priorities, A, B, and C. Almost all of the uh, A acquisitions are associated with that North Moorhead project, and we have acquired about half of those to date. And purchase agreements, I believe, in place for almost the other half, almost all of the other half. Along with that some are some infrastructure projects, and I don't want to go through these in detail to describe them. We've got maps in the back where you can take a look at those, and we'll have staff available to talk about those. The North Moorhead project that I mentioned. We have a proposed project in the Riverview Circle, 40th Avenue South area. Uh, there's a downtown sanitary lift station uh, that we're planning to relocate that's impacted at about 35 feet of river stage. Many of you probably know that the First Avenue North underpass floods uh, during large flood events, about 32 or 33 feet. Uh, we're working on a potential project to keep that open longer to a higher river stage and then several improvements to stormwater pump stations. A summary of the uh, cost estimates for all of those improvements, acquisitions, as well as infrastructure, uh, all totaled about uh, 50 $51 million, and again, we've received $6 million towards that to date. And then lastly, how does all of that tie into the uh, FM diversion project? All of the projects that we've completed, as well, of all, as well as all of those that are planned, are complementary to the diversion project. So with the diversion project, we would have a 100-year flood stage within the city of no more than 37 feet. And we would know that. All of that pre-event planning would be based upon, we know it's 37 feet. Interestingly enough, a 500-year flood stage, the 500-year flood stage would be 40 feet. And so throughout a large portion of the city with a diversion project in place, we would have 500-year protection. The other uh, potential uh, impact is on flood insurance. Without some sort of comprehensive project, FEMA has already made it very clear that they will be issuing new floodplain maps at some point in the future. It could be years out. Based upon the information that's available, somewhere between 700 and 1,300 properties would end up in the floodplain subject to flood insurance mandates. Flood insurance costs are uh, increasing fairly significantly every year. A uh, $1,000 policy in the floodplain is actually pretty cheap. We've seen numbers as high as four or 5,000. So you can do some simple math and get an idea of the magnitude of, of money that would be expended by property owners within the city. That really, does, it, goes, it goes elsewhere, right? Very little of that ever comes back to, to uh, people impacted by floods within the city. As I mentioned, a comprehensive project would really work to eliminate the uncertainty. You can see the uncertainty we have in preparing for flood events. How many sandbags do you need? How many do you make in advance? It eliminates that, and along with that, it eliminates the, uh, the financial risk that we have in preparing for flood events and fighting floods. Appreciate you taking the time to come out. As it looks now, this flood event is very manageable. Let's, let's hope for the best, no significant rainstorms. Uh, again, thanks for your time and have a great spring.